So this presentation is called You Can't Do This in the Movies. It's um, a series of techniques, four or five, that uh, are very comics-centric. They're very re related to the picture plane and the page. Um, it's about four or five techniques, so let's, let's get started and take a look. The first, um, uh, Scott McCloud likes to call it the politic. Um, people call it a pan sometimes, which actually is a movie term. Um, so um, let's look at it and see what it does when you're when you're looking at it in comics. So basically, we're seeing a background that doesn't change, but a character that moves across it. And that this is Scott McCloud's example where he names it a politic. Um, a character is moving across the kitchen. He's getting some food from the fridge. He is making himself a sandwich. He's leaving the the, the, the scene. Uh, you see it all the time. It's very common. It sometimes is just a nice way to break up time. In this case, it um, where this woman in purple is reaching for this person in the back. It gives that person a chance to recede really far from um, from the action in the foreground. Here, sometimes it's just thrilling to watch these bodies move through space. So we're seeing a, um, I think this is from Master of Kung Fu, and it's just, uh, you know, a building. We're seeing an extreme angle and uh, the fellow sort of leaping downward. Um, Early examples include Nemo, <clears throat> excuse me, Nemo and Slumberland, where you just get this very vivid and very beautiful uh, background and the, and the enormous um, lengthened bed traveling across it. Here's a great example from Jaime Hernandez, where the lead character, um, Izzy, realizes this uh, confrontation she has to have. It's in the last panel, and she moves across that scene. And you see her expression, you see her determination as she moves from all the way from the left across this field and a, a crowd of people to that last panel where uh, there's all, there's such, such a strong confrontation and heavy blacks and heavy whites. It's really great. You can have fun with it, like Dave Simmons. I think I've talked about this in other places where the um, background is staying the same, but the background has a character in it. The foreground character is moving a lot. In this instance, the background character isn't changing much at all. A little bit on her hands, if you look, actually. Um, but the fact is, is she's very resolute and um, and strong, and he is he is moving quite a bit anxiously throughout this scene. Um, this is a simple one. Let's see if we can shrink it. This is from Craig Thompson, and he uses things like this all the time. It's actually some sort of strange variation. She's reaching across the panel for uh, for this um, for his, this character and throwing him into the panel in the third panel. So this second, these these two here are kind of a pan, but it's funny that she's breaking over top of that gutter. This sorry, this from Seth. Uh, this is no characters in it. We're just panning. If that you want to use that word, we're breaking up our glances at this space, our glances at this background. It's a large movie theater, and this breaking it up gives us a chance to just have different thoughts in the captions, three, four, five. This is another variation on that, where a single image is broken up. This is from Bill Sienkiewicz in Straight Hosters. Um, and you're reading about this um, woman's background, and then She's talking about this boy, I believe is her son, if I remember right. And in the eighth panel, this knife reveals itself. It kind of reveals itself in the seventh panel. Would it have, been, would it have worked the same without the panel borders? Um, I don't know. It would, have, it would have been harder to sort of keep your, um, uh, your thoughts reading in this, this particular way. And um, in this instance, it allows that knife to be one of the last things you come to. And then ends with this darkness. Um, I see myself and I hate. It's a really um, interesting abstract version of that. Craig Thompson, again, will use um, a, a pan or a polyptic or some sort of variation on it here. We've got this enormous crowd scene. Our lead characters appear here in panel one and here again in what I guess we could call panel three. And she's there too, and they're there underneath. So this entire crowd doesn't change, but they move through it. It's a really, really beautiful example of that. Um, a lot of these owe a little bit to um, Frank King. He did this a lot in Gasoline Alley. Uh, one of the more famous ones is um, Walt and Skizik's moving across this beach. Uh, Walt tripping over this person here, falling. He gets nailed with this beach ball later, presumably from over here. 
um, then moving across, accidentally hitting somebody, getting sprayed by this dog, finally making it into the, into the water. Skis explodes up these water rings, and, uh, and they have this nice little exchange at the end where Walt tells him to fly, lie on his back, and Skizik says, oh, I wasted all my wind blowing up these water wings. It's really lovely. He did this all the time. Nobody, I don't think, was calling a polyptych then. I'm not sure if they had a word for it, but, um, but it's a really nice, elegant way to look at both time and space at the same time on the page. And again, you can't do this in the movies. Next is the multi-figure panel. Sometimes I call it a game board because it looks like characters moving across a game board sometimes. Um, and like the first one, there are variations. There's, it's not a codified term, and uh, there's lots of different ways in which it works. This um, first example, again, from Master of Kung Fu, um, and you'll have to see the PDF for some of the uh, references because there's one, one blogger who's done a lot of research in this. Um, and let's ignore this guy in the bottom left. But essentially, we're seeing the Master of Kung Fu character one, two, three, four, moving across this panel, jumping over this car, and about to catch this bad guy over on the right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that's just it. It's just the, mul the same character leaping over a space, usually used for thrills in this case. This is from uh, Killifer. This character um, moving across with this bow and arrow. He's um, sent it flying up there and moving. Oh no, I'm sorry. The, uh, it actually cracks and breaks here. And then he goes and follows this person um, up here who's all the way up here and has to be dealt with as they're hiding way up there. Um, so again, it's like a character moving across a game board, in this case a big forest, foresty uh, background. Killifer does this a lot, especially in his book 674, I hope I got the number right, Apparitions of Killifer, which is uh, an astounding creation. Um, he's moving across this bar scene here. Um, you could write a whole thesis about this book alone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Lauren Weinstein has done something similar here in The Goddess of War. Uh, the goddess, the main character of The Goddess of War is, is um, uh, let's say, mating with her, with her lover in this scene. And is, they're having some sort of, she is causing him to have some sort of trippy vision. And it actually does look a lot like a game board here as she moves across, as the two of them move across all the way through here. And then sort of disappear through this final kind of um, dreamy ring here at the end of this cliff. Uh, some people mention that this is similar to uh, Duchamp's New Descending a Staircase from way back when, and, uh, and maybe it is. Um, the next thing is um, tangents, and what some people, especially Sal Good Sam, who's, whose courses I recommend, um, calls rolling, uh, rolling uh, uh, transitions or, or rolling compositions sometimes. A uh, great example <laughs> can be seen here when two things are sort of interacting in a, in a way that's unpredictable. So we're seeing these uh, horns behind this guy, but it looks like he's got a horn hat. Um, usually when people speak about tangents, they are something that they try to avoid, but, but there's some really nice ways you can play with it. For instance, how Peter Cooper has created this back of this policeman and this arm as this way to sort of create a second character, a second version of the, of the policeman. The second, basically the third panel in the, in the comic is built inside of the second one. And it's all creating this like uh, claustrophobia around this character here. Um, Todd, Adrian Todd Webb does, has some, done some delightful things here where this girl is talking to this moon character. You gave me some light tonight, I did. All three of these are a sort of um, tangent Almost a, almost a, a kind of a politic in a way, but, a, but it's broken in this fourth panel where you, where you return to a regular sort of rhythm, comic rhythm, where, where the, each, each panel represents a different time and space. And I love it here, in the version here, panel two and panel four are, have this nice tangent um, and are sort of one image, but two wildly different times, well, not wildly different, but two very different times. Um, she's talking, then he, then he talks, and then he talks again. So it's not the same moment. Visually, it looks like the same moment. Um, this is, I forget the, oh, am I forgetting my, my French artist? Um, but it's in the, um, it's in the text file and in the acknowledgments. Um, but this is an early French, uh, comic, and you can see how this giraffe is 
so tall it's poking through many different panels. And the character, the main character, is uh, poking around it, talking about it, standing near it, standing on top of it, uh, etc. These were all sort of examples of tangents. Um, this is an interesting one because at first it looks like you're moving across a scene, but in fact these two people are fighting, and we're watching them fight once, twice, and a third time. But what's interesting is the way these skulls create a tangent here. This bouncing, this bouncing skull, there's a lot of skulls in the first panel. This bouncing skull and that bouncing skull are superimposed into both time and space moments. Um, and it feels like the skulls are bouncing up front towards the front of the, the picture plane. And in fact, when the, this foe is vanquished, his head looks exactly like one of those bouncing skulls. It's a really, really terrific thing from Frank Thorne. Um, this was sent to me, I think it's Alec, Rob, Alec, excuse me, Alex Robinson. The truth is, is I'm not 100% sure. But it's a, it's a uh, talking about this kid. And in fact, most of these drawings are not of the kid, even though the first glance, it looks like the kid. But it's only these last two of the six that are. What we see is glasses here. We see this flower, this outline of the stick. All of this other stuff goes to create that face um, as we're explaining some of his background, some of his um, childhood. It's a really terrific use of this. It's beautiful. As he's also got this um, uh, hook in his mouth. Actually, it's only that fifth panel. I've forgotten that um, that is actually part of the face. It's really great. So this tangents, these um, they can be really strange sometimes, and sometimes people just play with them, and I'm not even sure... What we're looking at, like, is this a? Uh, are we looking at this two views of the same um, car icon, the Mitsubishi or BMW or whatever that is, the, the hood ornament there? Is he really moving from one side to the other? I think it's a little playful. I'm not sure it is either <clears throat> of those two things. Um, in this one, he's tossing the phone out the window, and we see it there. But it's tan it's there's a tangent here with the next panel which seems like it's just moving the phone across the scene, but in fact it's not because we're looking at the back of the car now. And what we're seeing in this is the foreground, the car, the phone that's been left behind is, and is breaking. So these two pieces are sort of tangents and part of the same object, but in two different parts of time. It's really great. Which brings up this incredible um, Dan DiCarlo page from Archie, um, which people have talked about a lot, and, and, and everyone sort of agrees that it doesn't make sense, but it's still really striking. And this woman here seems to be moving across the scene in two different po points of time. But in fact, she couldn't be because there's two wildly different angles um, that we're looking at Veronica from and the rest of the beach from. Here we see the water and here we don't. It's just incredibly different. Um, so what we're seeing is not literal. We're not seeing the same woman. Well, I think what we're seeing is just a sort of game and a kind of trick that the artist is playing where he's trying to get you to look twice, the same way that Archie's looking twice. I think it's really brilliant for that reason. Um, and to show you that sometimes, <laughs> uh, this was sent to me too by a friend, and it's by a seven-year-old boy, and I think there's a moving character in this yellow here, but the tangents here between the panels are really interesting, and maybe maybe there's something innate in wanting to continue here, 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 especially here, um, here also. This, uh, these tangents and these sort of things that move these images and these parts of images and these um, compositional elements that move between panels. Um, next, meta panels and inset panels, mostly inset panels. Um, we'll look at this Will Eisner, which we've seen. These kids are running out. This is an inset panel when it's a panel sitting on top of one. That's what we call it usually. Excuse me. Everyone's waiting for that faucet, that fire hydrant to turn on, and he's doing that. It seems to last forever. And then after it's on, everyone splashes around. The rest, the other two examples are all from uh, Bill Watterson or Craig Thompson, both of who use these things a lot. So um, Calvin is imagining this careening airplane and this uh, careening train about to crash into each other here, and it's just getting completely out of control. And in the last panel, as, he's, as his imagination is getting crazier and crazier, his eye twitches involuntarily, and Hobbes is just uh, kind of incredulous, and he kind of wants to stop. He says, can't we play something else? This inset panel sort of like takes in the energy of all of that wild um, Im imagination, and, sort of, and it sort of like contains it here. Hobbes is trying to, to contain Calvin's imagination, so he sits right on top of there. And um, so here's another one. 
these two panels are sort of inset panels sitting on top of this one. This is a great, another one about Calvin's imagination. He is imagining himself to be a pterodactyl uh, running through this dinosaur uh, Jurassic world. And the teacher stops him, what state do we live in? It's a geography lesson. He says, denial. She walks off. So I, I suppose I can't argue with that. As she walks off, this other panel has already started. His imagination has started up already underneath those two panels. This big empty sky has already been given time to start up. These two panels sitting on top of that do that. And then he, uh, <clears throat> he flies away off of the page and into some new adventure. The great one here, we're only seeing the back of Calvin as he is flying down this, uh, down this mountain on this sled. Ready? Oh, and here we go down, and he's covered with snow, and he almost misses this tree, and then this black panel. Ooh, ah, eek. And the wog, and the, another uh, inset panel, black sounds, oof, oof, ugh, careening towards this tree. This bird flies away. We just get woo, 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 and then we see this from afar. We see Calvin's leg stuck in the snow. Last panel, I think that was our best ride ever, and Hobbes is coming up. He says, I kept closing my eyes. Let's do it again. And we realized that not only were these inset panels of sounds, they weren't just sound effects. We're actually it's actually representing Hobbes closing his eyes each time. So we get wow, closed eyes, wah, and closed eyes, oomph, oog, oog, wah, and closed eyes, woo, 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 woo. And it's a terrific use of, I mean, it would have been utterly charming if that didn't represent something literal, but when it does, it's really amazing. Um, here, Calvin is at, we've got these three sort of inset panels, sort of inset because they're sitting on top of a, maybe an empty box, not exactly another panel. Calvin's slowly having his mind blown, and that's why these three panels are sort of offset and diagonal and crisscrossing each other a little bit. Um, Calvin's asked what the meaning of life is, and Hobbes says, we're here to devour each other alive. <clears throat> um, and then Calvin, yeah, you get these three, whoop. Whoa, whoop. And of course, then it goes into the end where he's back home. He's trying to, excuse me, he's trying to be inside. He's trying to uh, stay safe, etc. But it's those three inset panels which sort of make the magic of that page. Um, Craig Thompson does this a lot in blankets and and a little bit in uh, Goodbye Chunky Rice. Here, uh, Craig and Raina are just sitting on top of this other panel, which is really decorative. It's just her blankets and quilts. And they're sitting on top of it. It's that panel. Here, when she's asking him to come to bed with her, it is this abstract sort of the blankets are becoming the environment, it's becoming the snow and the weather. On top of that is that moment where she whispers in his ear. It's this like half this isolated panel. It's, ha it's half bordered, half not bordered. It's really beautiful. Um, here's another example from Goodbye Chunky Rice. Here, the mouse, it's almost like a, a sort of a bit of a, a bit of a politic there, but not exactly. But here we definitely have an inset panel where the character is sitting on top of this larger panel. It might even be the same moment, or it might be a moment after the turtle is here, and the mouse is here, and and then we can flip that camera around and see the turtle from the front as he's having this sort of love moment. But we're still in the scene, you know. We're still got those waves washing behind us. We can hear it. We can see it as as we see the little turtle there. Here's another great one from, um, from Blankets from Craig. These two panels sitting on top as, as he plucks this eyelash off of, um, off of himself, and then she plucks one off of her there, and then they're staring at each other here. Um, there's a lot of interesting, beautiful things going on here. We have these, these three kind of representing a column of actions, pluck, pluck, and these three sort of representing three different... Uh, Three different panels too, but this is one panel with these two inset panels sitting on top, and then we get a different rhythm there. One, two, one. We get a one, one here, and then a, a single panel there. It's a really complex, complex page. Oops. Uh, last, we'll look at some diagrams, and uh, this is a real quick one. Um, I have uh, a few examples from Chris Ware and one from Lauren Weinstein. Uh, she did this in the Goddess of War, where she really just was showing the Goddess of War's cave <laughs> and was uh, in introducing some diagrammatic elements to show you the kind of environment um, that she lived she lived in, both outside the uh, flying fish harbinger of doom and both inside the sleep chamber, the information station, etc. But um, but this is something Chris Ware has used over and over again to really amazing effect, and it's so complicated that it, 
could probably take another presentation of its own, but it's really amazing. He's showing the um, background of these three characters, including the conception and birth of uh, this one too, and then the adoption of this character. And it's this long series of, of diagrams that are mostly silent that lead you to a better understanding of the background of this character. And then Chris Rick will sometimes get really, really um, uh, invested in, in complicating it in ways that make you really engaged but really interested. Um, and here you have to turn the page a lot, and, and there's comics coming off in different directions. It's really fascinating. Um, so that's just five examples of um, different techniques, the, the politics or the pans, the multi-figures or the um, game boards, um, the, world, the um, tangents, the multi, uh, and then the, <laughs> excuse me, the inset panels, and then the diagrams. Those are five things you just can't do in the movies. You're only going to see those on a comics page or maybe a, an interesting graphic design page. But since we're talking about narrative, we're talking about comics, It'll be our experiment to try something in the next section um, using one of these experiments.